Good evening, students. We are sponsored tonight by the much lauded University of Marijuana Amateur Face Painting and also Tits. <laughs> It's fucking hot, man. It's fucking hot in this room. And, uh, and uh, as, as such, we're, we're just going to be somewhat underdressed and, and painted like a rave fairy, which really feels quite appropriate for the subject matter. Because, yes, I have been meaning for a while to finally tell the tale of the rather perverse day when my quite long-term and pretty severe eating disorder was miraculously cured pretty much entirely in one day by a mushroom trip, <laughs> which is something I've kind of mentioned in passing, but I've never told the full story of. And uh, one of the reasons that I've not really told this story before is that it's not really what people want to hear um, when it comes to eating disorder recovery and things like that, because people, you know, if you have been depressed and you have been anorexic and all the rest of it, and you recover from that, and you're a very, a very colourful, perky person. <laughs> People do, they ask you, well, like, what did you do? What did you do? How, how did you stop being miserable? How did you do it? And I would love, I would, I would fucking love to have some logical, sensible, sane thing I could put in a book, make a fortune out of, uh, uh, you know, and sound sound like some some notable genius who has has the one key to unlocking the door of happiness. And uh, unfortunately, I obviously can't so much do that. All In all sensibility, I cannot recommend this route to anybody because so many people go the other way. So many people who have slightly perilous mental health and many people who are completely fine actually experiment with all the drugs I experimented with and it really fucks them up and makes them very depressed and suicidal and voices in their head in some cases and it can be bad. So it's it's a huge gamble, but equally, I really don't feel that telling anybody how you recovered from depression or an eating disorder I think it gives people hope but I don't think I don't think you can ever say oh oh here's the key that, that cured me here have it that'll let you out because it won't work everybody's door is fucking individual and you have to find your own key but uh, obviously you know to, to sort of get a little bit more into the history of all of this you know for centuries humans have you know, human tribes have relied on psychedelic drug trips as the way that you get over your problems. You know, if you have problems in your life, if there are things you can't overcome, you go to the shaman and he gives you a magical potion and he guides you through your trip. And that is really one of the most kind of original forms of therapy that, that we have. And, uh, you know, even in the modern day, science is discovering the potential between you know, the potential behind psychedelic type drugs and mental breakthroughs. There definitely is potential there, but, but as, a, as a final plea disclaimer, if you do hear any of this and think, you know what, this sounds interesting, or if you see a lot of the stuff that's going around at the moment about microdosing shrooms and LSD and how it's really good for depression, do your research. I really recommend, I'm actually watching one of his videos at the moment, Psych Substance. Also try Erawid. And for God's sake, if possible, get yourself a test kit. Before you put anything in your body, be more careful than I was in the days when test kits weren't really so much a thing. So anyway, moving on, uh, moving on from six minutes of, of tedious warnings and disclaimers, but you know what YouTube is like these days with drug stories. Even if you're, even if you're just trying to be harm reduction education, they, they still try and kind of ban your whole channel, so you, you gotta do a bit of this. But, um, okay, so I guess to give you backstory on the whole thing, um, from the, from the eating disorder standpoint, when this trip happened, it was actually I mean, I'd, I'd taken other drugs and I I guess the hardest thing I'd taken was ecstasy and speed at that point. But I'd never experienced a psychedelic before when this trip happened. It was my first fucking trip and it wasn't fun. It's not a fun story. It's not a, not a lovely breakthrough. Oh, and I saw the light and I realised that God loved me. Uh, why would I starve myself when God loves me and I'm such a beautiful creature and I'm going to skip through the forest for the next eight hours and be happy for the rest of my life? It wasn't like that. It was a horrible fucking trip and it, it, and it was it was awful and it was my first ever trip. But yes, when this happened, I think I was about 19 years old. Uh, my eating disorder, I mean, I'd been depressed like forever since I was about eight. Eating disorder developed at 14, but only really became particularly bad when I was about 
16, 17. Um, so by the time I was 18, it had been pretty terrible for a pretty long time. I had some therapy and some counselling. And if you've experienced NHS mental health care, you know it's a bit shit. So I'd never really had any luck with therapy. I'd just become more and more and more jaded to the whole thing because I had had so many bad experiences. And honestly, to this day, therapy has never helped me. I think... It's not the be-all and end-all cure. You know, there are certain people, you know, for myself, I value my own opinion more than others. Uh, I, I'm pretty intelligent and good at words, so I can I can justify myself around anybody. And uh, I'm very arrogant and very stubborn. And I don't listen to people. I have to fuck up for myself, and that's the only way I learn. So therapy is not, not for people like me. It doesn't work. Uh, so all in all, I'd, I'd attempted recovery on my own in this really blundering, dangerous way, but it hadn't really improved my behaviours, that I was really a sort of hybrid um, bulimic anorexic, you know, anorexia purging type was, was my label. But um, I went from crazy, crazy huge binges and purges to, like, days of restriction, but it didn't feel out of control to me. That was the, the, I don't really want to go too much into the whole eating disorder things here because it's, it's a whole, this is going to be a big video as it is. But um, yeah, for myself, I, I was never like a guilt binger. I never felt any kind of shame or disgust or anything about binging. It was planned. It was controlled. I enjoyed it. I, I wholly reveled in the fact that, look dude, I can eat fucking a whole cheesecakes and all this shit. Uh, be ridiculously skinny and believe you is way more fun than anorexia was the way I saw it but you know anorexia is just sitting around being cold and bored and thinking about food you can never eat whereas bulimia dude you're eating the fucking shit that's great when it's all you think about so you know so I, I felt actually I had this weird sense of pride in my eating disorder that it was like you know I've got the perfect elements of both you know I've got the clean kind of controlled feeling quite smug of anorexia but also the the kind of fun of bulimia and uh and so it fitted it fitted together for me and it you know it was something that kind of filled my life that it was like you know binge days and restriction days and and you know weighing yourself every morning and counting every calorie and it, it filled filled a whole big void and, and was sort of the whole thing that my life was about so to get back to the actual point of this video of the trip um before this trip occurred i had been occasionally and then more and more regularly taking ecstasy when i went clubbing so at that point the the trip occurred because um, my friend, uh, who was kind of my best friend in the world for a very long time, who was an ex of mine, phoned me up um, one day when I was at work and said, uh, I'm going to Amsterdam tomorrow. Uh, my friend is meant to be coming with me. There's a problem with his passport and he can't come. Uh, so we've got these tickets. Do you want to come to Amsterdam tomorrow? And, uh, and I said, well, actually, I've got a party tomorrow. Can I come out on Saturday? And we arranged that, so I went to my party on the Friday, which was a big, a big ecstasy fueled kind of house party thing. Um, so I ended up going to Amsterdam the next morning with pupils like saucers, still wearing my rave pants. Why they didn't search me on the aeroplane is, is quite surprising because people were giving me weird fucking looks. But um, got out to Amsterdam! And uh, I was like, wow, it was the first holiday, actually, I think of my entire life that I'd ever been on just with a friend. So it was really like, oh, oh, I'm adventuring with my friend. I'm out in a big, a big city, big city where weed is legal and everyone's smoking it. Oh, my God. And, uh, and it's just the two of us. We can rampage around and everybody is young and everybody is a backpacker. And it's ah, so fun. Um, so, yeah, so Amsterdam, I didn't actually trip in Amsterdam. I got the shrooms there um and, uh, and took them back home with me but kind of the relevant points of of the <laughs> the trip trip the amsterdam being their trip um was the eating i guess the if you've ever been to amsterdam you ain't gonna find a restaurant anywhere in the central part where you can just get a fucking salad or a fruit salad or any of the things that i was comfortable eating so eventually it's like it's fucking morning we're hungry uh we're kind of stoned and all there are are like Chinese restaurants and pastry shops everywhere. So it's kind of like anorexic worst nightmare. Um, and I, but I didn't want to be like a whiny bitch about it. If I'd been there with my parents, yeah, I'd have been a whiny bitch about it. Um, but being there with my friend, it was like good peer pressure. It was like, well, I don't, what, you know, 
he's he's cool and I like being with him and why why would I ruin this experience and ruin his perception of me by being that boring little cunt who stops everyone having fun and has a complete paddy in the road because they won't just eat a normal meal like a normal person for one fucking day uh, you know I didn't want to do that so in the end into the Chinese restaurant we went uh, nothing nothing safe on the menu at all uh, you know, and I wasn't the kind of person who wanted to go puke in a in a restaurant toilet, so that was out the out out the window too. I had to actually eat it and digest it. Um, so anyway, I ordered sweet and sour thing with rice, probably. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I I wasn't even gonna do the thing, you know, where you start dividing everything up on your plate and you kind of create like a little a little bit on the side and you're like okay well that's the safe bit I eat and everything else on the side of the partition you don't fucking eat that and I didn't even want to do that I was like you know I'm, I'm wandering around the city I don't want to be hungry and miserable he's eating his food and he's enjoying it so I'm just gonna eat mine too and, uh, and so that was what what happened for the rest of the weekend was that when he ate I ate and, uh, and I ate what he was eating and uh and it was really nice, you know, any, anyone who's ever even temporarily recovered from an eating disorder, an under eating disorder, um, you will know just how amazing you instantly feel when you have enough calories in your body. And it's like, wow, fuck, I, I have, I have energy, you know, because I mean, I, I guess I will get to this with the realizations that the trip gave me, but when your brain is so depleted, everything is so grey and so blah and you're so irritable all the time and then suddenly to feel like you could just like run up the street and back for the sake of it because you've got batteries again, <laughs> it's pretty amazing and um, you know, so there was that and there was like all the weed and the exploring this beautiful city and, uh, and it was all really fun and it was over way too quickly um, <laughs> so I came home with my mushrooms which I didn't know was illegal, I thought fresh rooms were legal so I just tossed them in my suitcase and I flew home and uh, it wasn't till I got back that someone told me they were actually class A now because of irrational drug laws <laughs> so that could have gone very very sideways do do be sure to to check check the legal issues if you're gonna go to a country like Amsterdam and, and go home with souvenirs but anyway I got home and it was it was kind of like a double clusterfuck actually that you know it was coming back from holiday which always sucks it's always like a head fuck you know that you come from this amazing place and then you go back home and if there are any problems in your life already you see them magnified and it's like oh my god my life is shit I don't like it <laughs> but uh you know it was that but also I was going from being with like my best friend on the whole fucking world like absolutely my soulmate spent the weekend together and it'd been so fucking fun and then I'd come home and I wasn't with him anymore and my house was empty because my parents were also on holiday so all there was was me, my two cats and my dog who at that point was very young and very crazy and loud and I've just... wow I've lost so much weight my ring came off my favourite one oh fuck anyway where was I? yes dog dog was crazy in those days um not good vibes to be around when you're tripping animals animals can be lovely when you're tripping but you do not want a big shouty crazy dog as a trip buddy you don't but um anyway so i get back home to this depressing empty house and my depressing fucking life for me was hey i'm home now i'm gonna stuff my face with sweet cereal and cakes and ice cream and throw it all up and uh and when you do that it does kind of fuck with the hormones in your brain I swear that you usually end up feeling either very kind of high in a weird dizzy way or more usually the more you do it you end up feeling quite kind of limp and depressed um, so that's, that was what was happening the, the time that I decided to take the shrooms was back in an empty house feeling shit, um, just like puked my guts up so I feel even more shit and, uh, and I thought well I'm bored, I'm bored and I'm miserable so I'm gonna take some drugs because that'll kind of cheer me up and give me something to do uh, you can see the kind of mis <laughs> misapprehensions you get when you go into actual psychedelics from ecstasy that you know ec ecstasy is kind of psychedelic and is very psychedelic sometimes 
but it's so uplifting and so positive that whatever happens doesn't scare you. So I was thinking of shrooms like they were ecstasy, like, well, yeah, I'm just going to drop this and it'll cheer me up and I'll bounce around and I'll see some colours and it'll be really fun. And I had done no research whatsoever. I'd done no research on on mushrooms at all. I mean, it's crazy to me because I'm so obsessive about researching things now. Like, I, I would not conceive of just taking something I, I hadn't researched, but then... I'm just going to see some, some little pixies and I'm going to see some colours and oh, it'd be quite fun, it'd be a bit like being stoned but with pretty, pretty patterns to see and it's like, you know fucking nothing because it is the misconception of tripping that it's it's all visual, everything is visual that you know, you're just like maybe a little bit giggly but you're just kind of like, wow, oh my god, wow, this is so cool and so long as that you remember that, you know, even if you see a scary thing, it's not real then uh, you'll have a fine time and uh, that is really nothing like any psychedelic I have ever tried. Visuals, you may not get any visuals. I would often find if I was tripping and I was a bit stressed out, my brain would blot out the visuals and I wouldn't see anything. Um, you know, the visuals are like the snow on top of the mountain. Um, because bear in mind, you can trip with, with every sense, as in you can hallucinate with every sense. You know, you can hear things and feel things that aren't there which most people aren't prepared for, um, and the, the mind fuck. The mind fuck is a huge thing that you, you can't conceive of until you've tried it and experienced your own brain, because everyone's brain is going to mind fuck in a different way. You don't know how weird and unique your, your brain's interpretation of what the fuck is going on? Everything I think I know about the universe and myself is unravelling before my eyes until there is no language. I, I am floating out of my body. I, I am an entity beyond time, space and language. And I... <laughs> you know, how, how, how your brain is going to respond to that? You don't know till you get there. But uh, I, I didn't know these things, so I, I, just, I just took the mushrooms. And... Uh, and then I think I went, yes, I went upstairs and probably smoked a bit of weed and I was on the computer, I didn't even have my own computer back then. I was over there in my parents' room on their computer um, and I, I was on like, you know, old kind of dial-up things. I was on Live Journal, like there was no Facebook, probably no YouTube, so I was on Live Journal and I was listening to music and I remember the moment that I first noticed it kicking in was really the only time I noticed visuals during this trip. I was listening to um, Colony 5, oh god, what's the song called? Colony 5? Fuck, I'll write the word, I'll write the title on the screen. But it's a Colony 5 song and it, it, I loved them for like drug, drug music. They were so kind of, the, the synths are just so bouncy and like sugar candy exciting and ah. Um, but I misheard the lyrics. There's this lyric that says something like, I'm love in disguise but I heard it as I'm loving the skies, which prompted me to look out of the window and the clouds, there was this amazing formation of clouds, kind of like a reasonably dense kind of bank of them. But right in the middle, there was just this beam of light. Like there was a break in the clouds and this golden crazy beam of light was just coming down. Um, you know, like shining God's fucking spotlight on the world through these clouds and it was like they were parting just for me and there was this thing and uh, I still actually have the live journal entry um, from that day somewhere deep in the recesses of my computer and, uh, and I said something like um, wow, there's a crazy god hole in the sky. Um, I said something about, about you know, enjoying post-Amsterdam experiences. And uh, my friend who I'd been on the holiday with kind of commented and said something like, ah, so you, you're trying out the uh, the shrooms that I see. I hope you have a safe trip or something. Um, and, uh, you know, and at that point, I actually thought, oh my god, this is actually going to be really fun. Like, check out the god hole in the sky. And the weird thing is that that trip was so many years ago. I mean, that was well over a decade ago. And I have never looked at clouds the same way since. Like, literally to this day, if I see a certain formation of clouds, pretty much any kind of, like, blue sky with some cloudy bits on, I almost crash my fucking car. Like, I, I can just stare at them forever. They're so just impossible you know the depth of it and the way they stack on each other and bleh, you know 
sorry, hair in my mouth. Just the enormity, the enormity of the sky and the clouds and like the vastness and the fluffiness. And it's like, how the fuck? But I, you know, and that's still how I feel to this day. Every time I see clouds that are like that, I, I clouds have blown my mind ever since my first mushroom trip. No matter how sober I am, clouds are the weirdest, trippiest fucking things I've ever seen. So, is it, I, I, you know, if I could have just kept that bit of the trip, it would have just been a fun, bouncy thing. But unfortunately, you know, as in fear and loathing, uh, the acid had shifted gears on him. The next thing would probably be a five-hour introspective nightmare, um, <laughs> which it kind of was. So the first thing that the kind of started was just this general feeling of not rightness like I don't know if I need to like move or be somewhere or like do something else other than this or change the music or like something about the vibe is is not good um and I think I went and smoked some more weed then which I think made everything worse actually usually weed is very very nice to me but uh on that occasion, I think it just it exacerbated the the bodily feelings, because the next thing that came on was this unbelievably vile uh, sense of gravity. It was like I had never. It's like I I'd lived my entire life on a planet without gravity, and suddenly I had been transported to Earth, and the weight of the world and the, the air and everything just on my whole body you know including kind of my lungs and my heart i just felt like all of me was just being kind of crushed by the the weight of fucking existence um and that was the point at which i started moving around the house like crazy like i tried lying on the sofa for a bit I literally lay in every fucking bed in the house um, because I was like, different vibe, different person's vibe, different person's room, different person's vibe, put on somebody else's vibe might be better. Um, and it wasn't, it didn't matter where where I lay, it was still it was just crushing, it didn't matter about the position, crushing, horrible, horrible. In retrospect, I should have tried going outside, just just into the garden, nowhere intimidating, but just into the garden. And I think that would have distracted me and I think I would have seen more visuals because, you know, the sky was amazing. I could have gone out and looked at the sky and I didn't. I stayed inside and that was a mistake. Um, but I, my one of my cats started turning into my little trip sitter. We had a little black and white cat called Tessa who was like a perpetual kitten. She was tiny and wiggly and she said, prow, prow, and uh, she was lovely. And she started following me around like a little nursemaid. Um, whatever bed I was lying in, she would come and be with me. And, uh, and that wasn't like her at all, to be still and to just lie down and purr and be like a calm little buddy. Because usually she would be wiggling around, like rubbing her butt in your face and all of this. And, uh, but she didn't. She totally settled down. She was just purring. And she was like the one kind of settling thing there was, okay, cat, nice, nice, soft, nice, soft cat. Little soul, little soul in bed with me. Little soul understands. <laughs> But th I think at some point I'd settled in my own bed up there with Tessa and uh, that's the main place I remember it, it all becoming this introspective thing about the eating disorder and about how shit my life was. So to boil it down before I can waffle much more, the basic realisations that I had about the eating disorder was like, you came home from holiday and the first thing you did was to eat some food and then deliberately puke it back up again uh, and then walk around being hungry and miserable and dizzy. Do you not realise that a five-year-old child left alone in the house would take better care of itself than you? Like, how fucking stupid are you? Just as a, as a, as a human being, as a specimen of an animal species, what the fuck are you playing at? You are a Darwin Award. You do not deserve to to be existing as a specimen of evolution. Like how how can you be living in a house where you have food and you are nineteen fucking years old and and all you do is is chew it and and regurgitate it and spend money you don't have on food that that you basically just gargle. <laughs> what the fuck? 
it seemed so stupid to me but it didn't seem funny at the time it seemed just crushingly like realizing you're the biggest idiot in the world and then the next thing i realized was oh, of course you're fucking miserable there is no way in hell you are ever going to be anything other than miserable if you keep doing this that to me it became this analogy of like a car um you know that the, your soul your soul is really you but on this plane of existence you you have a car which is your body and it's the only way you have of moving around on this plane of existence and experiencing anything and so if you know your car your vehicle you don't put fuel in it you slash the fucking tires and set it on fire you are just going to be stuck at home in your shitty little apartment staring at four walls and uh you know and watching flies buzz around and you were going to be miserable as shit of course you are how can you ever be anything other than miserable when all you do is is sit inside your own brain with no stimulation no entertainment no amusement what do you expect whereas you know your car put fuel in the bloody car fix it you you can go anywhere you know you can you can go and see the Taj Mahal you can go to Disneyland you can do anything and uh, you might not enjoy it you might still be bloody miserable but there's a chance there is a chance um you know because it occurred to me that well duh your brain is fucking starved your brain is is starving you look at people who are normal weight and eat normally they just get a little bit hungry because their dinner is late they get tetchy they get irritable uh they get miserable they snap at everyone and it's like you, you've taken that state and you've gone you know what that looks fucking fun i'm gonna live in that for years and years and years and exacerbate it as much as possible and I'm, for some reason, I'm going to complain about the fact that I'm unhappy. Are you thinking, what do you expect? There is no way you can ever achieve a state of genuine happiness while you are starved and malnourished and depleted of all sorts of things that make your body work. Uh, you know, you, you, have, you have to fix the car. For the car to run, you have got to fix the fucking car. And then you have some chance of being happy. Uh, basically these were the realizations and they went round and round and round my head for eight solid fucking hours and time had slowed down I mean literally I would feel like oh my god half an hour of this nightmare has got to be over and I'd check my watch and it would be two minutes <laughs> I'd be like Are you serious this is I don't think anything is ever going to change again I think I think this is what existence is it's just lying in this bed and a being fucking whipped and whipped and whipped by this like internal therapist who's hard as nails about how stupid you are and you can't escape it this is all i am ever going to experience for the rest of my life and uh eventually eventually thank god it did start to fade and the, the feeling of being crushed by gravity never went away it was horrible um but the, eventually it started to fade and i was just feeling kind of like just shaken and just kind of shell-shocked by the whole thing and uh i remember being downstairs with my dog and the sofa bed out and uh and watching black books and it was the episode where bill bailey's character um gets locked in the shop and uh and he's he's like eating toasted wasps and saying i'm a lonely little soldier and <laughs> i was sitting on the bed like wrapped in a blanket going i know how you feel i'm a lonely little soldier too this is an intense fucking day and uh eventually eventually i got some sleep but um yeah the the realizations i had had been beaten into my head so profoundly by the end of that shit that um the very next day i put all of that in into action which for me was to up my calories a day from whatever they were at that point probably something like 700 to 800 a day on restriction days i imagine um which is not enough not enough it's, it's not as ridiculously low as some people go but it, it's, it's still still gonna make you a bit crazy um <laughs> so I'd, i upped that to 1500 a day which you know some people will say is still not enough for me it's basically what i've lived on all of my life apart from you know being a bit flabby at the moment but <laughs> most of my life i've stuck to 1500 and i think 1500 is is honestly the perfect number for most humans who are fairly sedentary i think if you've got an active life sure the 2000 they recommend 
maybe you need that but actually most of us we sit on our fucking asses all day so 1500 i upped it to that i mean admittedly my 1500s these days are with a bit of leeway back then i i couldn't it took me a while to actually free up like you know what i'm gonna eat a thing and not look at the calories to me a very long time to be able to do that but for this first stage up to 1500 and uh and i found it did exactly what the mushrooms had told me it was gonna do that um yeah you know i gained some weight but it wasn't that significant i was still very 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 underweight um for quite a long time on 1500 calories a day but it it took away the craziness that sets in when you cut your calories down too low um you know all the the just the misery and also the food obsession which leads to binging and purging i've never been a bingy person normally if i'm eating well and i have no fucking desire to eat a whole cheesecake with a spoon but at uh, the minute i limit myself too low it's like uh, yes i'm going to be doing all that stuff so that that element just went away because i no longer had any interest in it um i you know i had more energy i, I had more more brain power to to do things and to talk to people so going out and, and taking ecstasy and, and progressing on to more and more and more psychedelics having more weird experiences so yeah so basically drugs drugs were a bit of a wobbly path but it got me out and it gave me it gave me one of the happiest years of my life i mean the the year that honestly stood for many many years as the happiest fucking year of my life started really with that shroom trip with getting out of the worst of the eating disorder and just really throwing myself into having a life and experiencing things experiencing more things <laughs> and having a fun time and uh yeah and i mean i have i have kind of relapsed with the eating disorder since then but I've always felt like a tourist, like a complete fucking tourist. And honestly, other people see it in me. Like people I, I use, well, I still know, but people I used to know better from eating disorder forums. Like if I return there kind of semi-relapsing, they know I'm a complete fucking tourist. Um, because it's obvious that I enjoy it too much. That these days, if I go back to it for anything, it's literally kind of like nostalgic fun. I mean, that sounds really twisted and fucked up, but when it's the way you spent your kind of adolescence and the way you made a lot of friends and one of the first identities you created for yourself i guess there's always going to be a bit of nostalgia attached to that i think i think honestly anyone with an eating disorder particularly people who were part of the early forums and that's a whole different subject for another day but you know the early eating disorder forums that were such a crazy world uh, if you were a part of that and you've recovered, I don't think there's a single one of us who doesn't have some nostalgia for how it used to be and for all the craziness. So now and then, you know, I have gone back and kind of dabbled in it, you know, sometimes for a few months, sometimes losing quite a lot of weight. But the whole time I've always known I'm only doing this for as long as it's fun. And uh, the minute something better comes along, I'm going to be off into it. I've never had any fear that, OK, this is actually going to take a hold on me. And it's literally been, you know, the minute I've kind of got a new job or found a new interesting drug or just just got fucking bored of it. Uh, the eating disorder is gone and um, it never it never becomes that kind of absolute compulsion with rules that you wouldn't even consider breaking it's always a kind of eh, optional this is kind of entertaining for a while makes me feel young <laughs> um so yeah on that day pff, everything everything was broken and i have talked for the most ungodly length of time so i suppose i'm going to shut up here but uh yeah so there's there's the story of the weird way that i mostly got over my eating disorder a very intense therapy session all inflicted by my own head and some fungus <laughs> which took place and it, it literally was like years and years of therapy condensed into eight hellish hours um so uh, i guess if you're if you're really desperate and all other things have have failed do do your research uh maybe consider consider kind of micro dosing first i think that's if i was to go about doing shrooms ever again that's probably what I would do. I would probably start with a microdose and just see, can I handle like a little bit of the feeling? And I would also probably keep around some Valium. Um, if it went wrong, I could take some of those and hopefully it wouldn't be too awful though. Those would be, if I was to, to have my time again, that's what I would have done. But <laughs> anyway, if anyone else has uh, any 
questions or any very peculiar stories of of recovery from all sorts of things because you know I've heard other people actually talk about uh you know spontaneously quitting addictions after psychedelic trips you know even if they didn't want to like me that you know it hadn't been on my mind I'm gonna take these shrooms and, and try and cure my eating disorder because like so I hadn't researched so that that idea would have been mad to me like why why would I take a party drug and assume it's going to change my life because that was my perception so you don't know what you're going to get out of it. It's, it could all be very strange. I mean, you know, like the thing, the thing with me and the clouds. Many, many years later, and I can't look at a cloud normally again. And, uh, and that shows the power and the lasting power of what it can do to you, which is not always a fun thing, like getting over an eating disorder or loving clouds. <laughs> um, it, it can be a horrible thing. It could be a horrible thing. It, it could jam in your mind forever. So be aware of that. Treat psychedelics with great respect. I honestly kind of fear and always have feared the power of psychedelics far more than something most people would fear, like injecting heroin. That, that never never seemed scary to me but psychedelics every fucking time scary uh which is how i kind of feel it should be um not party drugs um big big important important teachers important teachers um <laughs> that's what they are right this is ridiculously long so me me and my near nudity and my, my very colorful face we're gonna go away and uh, i think i probably do want to do more more kind of trip reports about trips that were actually trips with you know visuals and fun things going on and uh, i'll do those in future but yeah going away now bye, -bye. <laughs>